Hello everyone! Today we will get comfortable with Sphina in C++. The goal of this video is to give you many examples and explain each one of them thoroughly so that in the end you will be able to understand Sphina and use it in your own code. I might go slow at times but it's because I want to ensure that by the end of this video you will have a solid grasp of the subject. People often find Sphina difficult to understand and indeed Parts of it require deep understanding of the standard. The syntax can also be very non-intuitive. It's going to be a long video, so sit back, grab a cup of your favorite beverage, and let's get started. Before we begin, some things to note. First, this video is not for beginners. I will assume you are already rather familiar with templates, classes, and C++. Secondly, this code is not optimized. I will not be using move semantics, perfect forwarding, and so on. The reason is I want to keep things as simple as possible and focus on Sphina. Finally, there will be a lot of explanations and code. I recommend turning on the subtitles. I've made sure they're correct. Then I encourage you to pause or rewind the video whenever you feel you're falling behind. Oh, one more thing about that. If you want the code in a more usable format, I will publish a written blog post with this tutorial once I reach 1000 subscribers on my YouTube channel. So if you like my videos and want easy access to the code in the slides, please subscribe. Now let's do a very quick recap of templates in C++. A template is a blueprint for a function or a class. It's not a function or a class itself, but rather a description of how to create one. The compiler will substitute the template types with the types you use in your code. This is the substitution that Sphina is all about. It will create a new definition for each type you use. For example, if you have the foo template function and you instantiate it with an integer and a double, the compiler will create two definitions, one for a foo that returns an int and takes an integer as an argument, and another foo for the double. If you aren't familiar with templates, I strongly recommend you read up on them before continuing this video. It's going to get much more complex from now on. So, what is Sphina? It stands for Substitution Failure is not an error. The simplified idea is that the compiler will not generate an error while it tries to substitute the template types with the types you used in your code. This is as long as there is some alternative way or candidate to replace them that will actually work. In other words, if there are many candidates for an implementation, it is okay for them to fail to compile during type substitution as long as there is another candidate that succeeds. A practical application of this is if you have two different implementations that check for equality between two numbers. If the arguments are floating point numbers, you use one implementation, and if they are integers, you use another. The goal of Sphina is to select one implementation over the alternatives based on some characteristic or trait of the types used in the template. For example, imagine a player template class that gets an add-on type as a template parameter. So we can have an, a jetpack add-on, a wings add-on, a horse, a boat, and so on. We can create players with any of these add-ons. With Sphine, we can select a different implementation for the go to player member function of player when a player has an add-on that provides flying capabilities. Listen, I'm not talking about any particular type. It's not about the jetpack or the wings. It's about the fact that an add-on providing the ability to fly. We do this for the other types too, the horse, the boat, or anything else. The idea is that depending on the add-on's characteristics, the go-to target member function of player does something different. And remember, since we're talking about templates, this is decided during compilation. With Sphina, we can also disable certain implementations due to the presence or absence of specific characteristics. For example, a player instantiated with the boat add-on cannot have a fly member function. 
By disabling these functions because of the absence of an add-on with flying capabilities, we prevent our user from calling it by mistake. Compile time checks is the ultimate way to prevent misuse of an API, right? With Sfine, we can also do introspection of a class. What does that mean? We can check, for example, if a class has a specific member function or not. If type T has a member function called fly, then our travel function eventually makes a call to the travel by air implementation. If it doesn't, then it calls travel by land. Now, I'm going to give you a very important advice. Are you ready for it? Do not use Sfine unless you really need it. If you can do the same thing in a different way, usually that other way is simpler and does not give you the weird compilation errors Sfine does. Let's check out the alternatives. Do you know exactly what types you're going to use? In other words, can you select a behavior based on which type it is instead of what the type can do? Then usually you can go for overloading. Super simple, easy to understand. Is overloading not enough and you need templates? Then specialize them. Don't use Sfine if the behavior you're going to choose between depends on specific types rather than characteristics. Another alternative is to use tag dispatching. Unlike the two previous techniques, here we can select a behavior based on a characteristic of a type. We combine templates and overloading as we select a behavior based on the tag type. If we pass a number, we call the first overload of get value impl, otherwise the second. We often use tag dispatching for creating our own type traits to use with Sfine. But regardless, if you can use tag dispatching instead of Sfine, go for it. A variant of tag dispatching you may also come around to see is to use classes as tags. This is effectively the same thing as before, but now we have more than two tags. Instead of having just true type and false type, we can have a tag for every behavior we would like to select. C++ is notorious for allowing you to do the same thing in many different ways. Yet another way to do tag dispatching is by using non-type template parameters as tags. This is a bit less readable, but slightly better than Sfine. We are partially specializing the toString impl template class based on the value of the non-type template parameter. The compiler will select the most specialized implementation. So when we call toString with type t not being a number, then toString impl is instantiated with a zero as the second template parameter. As a result, the specialization is selected over the base case as the most specialized one. If t is a number, then the base case is selected. As of C17, we have if const expert, which is a compile time if statement. This means that only the code that is inside the branch that is being followed gets compiled. If you can get away with using if const expert instead of Sfine, you should certainly do it. It's way simpler and more readable, in my opinion. Finally, if you're using C20 or later, you can use concepts. With concepts, choosing the right implementation is done in a more readable way than Sfine. Additionally, the compiler errors you get are considerably better. In fact, once concepts become more widespread, I expect to see Sfine less and less. Nonetheless, the Sfine man state is still useful to know and understand. In this example, the first implementation is selected as the most specialized one if type T is a floating point number. I know I said this before, but I want to repeat it. Use Sfine only as a last resort. Go for overloads and template specialization if you're working with specific types. If you can get away with it, go for tag dispatching or if const expert. And of course, concepts if you are in C20 codebase. Now that you know some of the potential alternatives, let's take a look at Sfine. The idea is that we will exploit substitution failure in the template parameter list, the template return type, and the template function arguments. Let's start showing how to use Sfine without introducing any new feature of the language. Take a look at the implementation of R equal. 
The goal is the same as before. When we compare two floating point numbers, the equality operator is not good enough. We will take advantage of a rule that says that C-style arrays need to have a size larger than zero. Compiling an array of size zero will fail. Now, let's take a look at the second argument of the R equal impl functions. It looks weird, but it's not something exotic. It is a char C-style array named F. Its size is I modulo 2 compared to 0 or 1. It has a default value of null. We default it to null because we don't want to care about it. The only purpose with it is to induce a compilation error. Next, let's focus at the first R equal impl function. If I is an even number, then I modulo 2 is 0. When we compare it to 0, the result is true. When we use true as the size of the array, true casted to a number becomes 1. In other words, we end up with an array of size 1, something that's perfectly legal. Let's take a look at the second R equal impl function. If i is an even number, then i modulo 2 is 0. When we compare it to 1, the result is false. False casted to a number becomes 0. An array of size 0 is illegal, so we get a compilation error. Is it reported? No, because the compiler will not report a substitution error as long as there is an alternative viable candidate. And what is that viable candidate? The first R equal impl function. Let's break things down even further. Take a look at what happens when we call R equal with two floating point numbers. First, the is floating will become 1. Then, R equal impl will be instantiated with 1 as the second template parameter. It is an odd number, so what happens? The first R equal impl function fails to compile. Remember, the size of the array there is only valid for even numbers. However, the second one succeeds, so it is selected. What happens when t is not a floating point number? Is floating becomes 0. 0 is an even number, so as we described before, with an even number, the first r equal impl function succeeds. The second candidate, on the other hand, gets an array of size 0 as its second argument, so it fails to compile. The error is not reported because the first r equal impl function is a viable candidate. Confusing? I know. I hope that by the end of this video you will have become fluent on this. Until then, feel free to pause the video to take a better look at the code. Let's try some introspection. Let's check if a class has a static member variable called bullets. If that's the case, we should pick the first implementation. If it has a missiles, we should pick the second implementation. Like in the previous example, we take advantage of substitution failures at the function parameters, particularly the second parameter of the functions. If you find the decal type expression strange looking, let me simplify it for you. It means that the second argument is a pointer of the same type as robot colon colon bullets or missiles. It does not have a name and its default value is null. We use the same trick as before with the defaulted argument that we don't want to care about when using the function just to induce a compilation error. If we use handle enemies with robot A that has bullets as a static member variable, then the second implementation fails to compile since robot A missiles does not exist. Is that a problem? It's not as long as there is an alternative viable candidate. And which one is that? the first implementation. Similarly, if we use handle enemies with robot B that has missiles as a static member variable, then the first implementation fails to compile since robot bullets does not exist. Feel free to pause the video and take a better look at the code. Another way to use Fina is by inducing a failure on the return type. Here we would like to use the first implementation of get address if the type S has a subclass called IPv4. If it has a subclass called IPv6, we would like to use 
the second implementation. What happens if we instantiate get address with sensor A as its type? Well, sensor A has a subclass called IPv4, so the first implementation is selected. The second implementation fails to compile because the sensor A IPv6 subclass simply does not exist. Similarly, if we were to pass a sensor B that has an IPv6 subclass, then the first implementation would fail to compile. Feel free to pause the video and review the code yourself. Before we move on, I'd like to ask you a question. There's a sensor C that has both IPv4 and IPv6 subclasses. What happens then? Which of the two implementations is selected? I'll let you pause the video and think about it. Did you come up with some answer? Let's see if you are right. This will not compile because get address is now ambiguous. You have two candidates that are equally suitable for the call, so the compiler does not know which one of the two to pick. So yes, Sfina, as long as there's a candidate that compiles, but there cannot be too many viable candidates either. So far I have shown you how to use Sfina without introducing any new or exotic features of the language. We talked about a sysstyle array of size 0 that cannot compile and the member variable or a subclass that does not exist. Let's take a look at our failure inducing Sfina super weapon called enable if. Enable if is a template class that has a public member type definition called type equal to the second template parameter if the first template parameter is true. On the other hand, if the first template parameter is false, then there is no type member definition. Let's take a look perhaps at the simplest example we can get. If the first template parameter is true, then enable if has a public member type definition called type. The type of type is the second template parameter. In the first line, we instantiate enable if with true, as the first template parameter and int as the second. So the enable if type exists and it's an integer. The first line is equivalent to writing int i is zero. We can do this with any type, a string will also work, as you can see in the second line. If we do not specify the second template parameter, it defaults to void. Now, take a look at the last line. The first template parameter is false. What does this mean? It means there is no type member type definition. Therefore, the last line will not compile. Feel free to pause the video and perhaps start thinking of how we can use this in Sfina. Let's take a look at some a bit more realistic examples with enable if so you can get familiar with the syntax. The type float is a floating point number, so the first template parameter is true. As a result, enable if has a public member type definition called type of type int. If we don't specify the second template parameter, it defaults to void, as we can see in the second example. What happens if the first template parameter is false? Then there is no type definition. In other words, the last line will not compile. A float is not an integral number, so the first template parameter is false. Trying to access the type member type definition will fail during compilation. To save you some typing, there's a helper called enable if t, enable if type. Use it to skip writing colon colon type after enable if. Pause the video to have a look at the code and continue when you're ready. One may ask, what's the point of enable if with false as the first template parameter? It doesn't compile. Why would we ever need something that does not compile? The answer is that it becomes our Sfina super weapon. Do you remember all the examples we saw before that were not using enable if? It's unlikely you will ever see them in real code. If you want to induce a failure, the most readable and flexible way to do it is with enable if. Let's take a look at the equality implementations again. Now we're using enable if to induce a substitution failure on the third argument. When we call r equal with two floating point numbers, the first implementation is selected and the second one fails to compile. Now focus at the first candidate. 
When t is a float or a double, the first template parameter of enable if is true. As a result, the type member definition exists, so this compiles. Since a second template parameter is not provided, it defaults to void. The second implementation has a negation in front of the floating point check. This means it will fail to compile because the first template parameter of enable if becomes false. As a result, there is no type member. In the next slide, we will take a closer look by doing the substitutions ourselves. Feel free to pause the video and try to see what should happen if t is, let's say, a double. If t is a double, then the third argument of the first implementation is a void pointer. It is also unnamed and has a default value of null. This means we can ignore it when we call the function. On the other hand, the second candidate fails to compile because, well, not true is false and therefore no type member definition exists. As we saw before, we can utilize sfinne on the return type. In this example, we don't use a third argument for sfinne. Please pause the video and try to understand what's going on here. We use enable if with the intended return type bool as the second template parameter. If t is a floating point number, then only the first candidate will compile and the return type will be a bool. If t is not a floating point number, then only the second candidate will compile. If you haven't seen enable if before, you may find this piece of code not so readable. Don't worry, I trust that by the end of this video, you will be able to read it like a pro. We haven't seen this substitution failure before, but we can also use enable if on the template parameter list. If substitution succeeds, the second type of the template parameter list will be of type int. It will be defaulted to zero and unnamed, so we can basically ignore it. The idea is that the substitution should only succeed on one of the candidates only. If t is a double or a float, then the first implementation will be selected, otherwise the second. If you ask me, this isn't very readable, so pause the video and take a look at the syntax. Looking at the previous example, one may ask, why do we need to create a known type template parameter and default it? Can't we instead use an unnamed type template parameter of type void or whatever? Unfortunately, that won't work and the reason is deep in the standard. The problem with Sfina is that it often forces you to look deep into the standard to troubleshoot your code. The error messages are usually not very helpful either. Is there a way to make things more readable? Stay with me to find out. I think we can all agree by now that Sfine looks a bit ugly. Can we make it better? Yes, we can, by creating our own traits. Of course, creating our own traits is not only about making things more readable, but also about reusability. Here's a very simple trait. isFloat and isFloatAlt widths are pretty much equivalent. isFloat is a template class that extends a false type in its base case. If t is a float, then the specialization is chosen and extends the true type instead. Is float alt does not extend anything but instead has a static memory variable called value. In its base case, the value is false. When the type is a float, the specialization is chosen and the value is true. This is a very simple and rather redundant trait, but you can get an idea of how to create your own traits. Let's see how isFloat could be used. Again, this is a rather dumb example, but let's go with it for the sake of simplicity. In the first candidate, the first template parameter of enable if is true if isFloat colon colon value is true, or if the type is double, or rather it's the same as double. We haven't achieved anything different or better than before, but I wanted you to show you how you could use your own traits. You will very often have to create your own traits and trade combinations to achieve what you want. Here are some traits that combine other traits. The first one is float or double, combined the 
is float and is double traits. It does so with the disjunction, which is the logical or of template metaprogramming. Is not float or double is the negation of the previous trait. Is float and trivially constructible used conjunction, which is the logical end for a list of types. The benefit of creating these custom traits is one, readability, and two, you can reuse them in multiple places. I don't want to make you upset, but another common way to create a trait is with Sphina. Here we have the is integral base case that extends the false type. We've seen this before. The new part is that we have a second template parameter that is unnamed and defaults to void. Next, there's a specialization which extends true type. It will be selected if t is an integral number and the enable if type compiles. I'll let you pause the video and think about it. One thing you need to watch out for is the type of the second template parameter. The types of the base case and the specialization must be the same. In the previous example, we used void, which was the default type of enable if. If we use a different type, we need to make sure that if the substitution succeeds, the types match, otherwise the specialization will not be selected. It is only when we have a matching specialization that the most specialized one will be chosen. Another handy type we use with traits is void underscore t. What it does is turn any type or list of types into void. I know what you're thinking, why would that be useful? Well, it ties in with the previous example. To consider a specialization, it needs to match the type of the base case. Let's consider this has bullets example. Which should inherit true type if t has a static member variable called bullets. If we skipped the void t part, how would we match the types of the base case and the specialization? We don't know if t colon colon bullets exists or not. So we can't really use it in the base case. Instead, we use void in the base case and wrap t bullets into a void t type in the specialization. If bullets exists, then void t bullets is void and the specialization will be selected. If bullets does not exist, then Sphina and the base case will be selected. Don't worry if you don't understand this right away. It's a bit tricky. Feel free to pause the video. Looking at an earlier example, is there a way for a robot without missiles or bullets to handle enemies? I will save you the trouble, you can do it, but only with an able T. If you can think of any other way, please let me know in the comments. As a first step, we create several traits to check if a robot has missiles, bullets or no weapons at all. Then we will use these traits to create another handle enemies candidate. This is one way to refactor the handle enemies functions to use traits, sphena and handle the case where a robot has no weapons at all. We take advantage of Sphina on the return type to select the right implementation. Remember, since we're not specifying a second template parameter for enable if, the return type of the candidate that succeeds to compile will be void. Keep in mind that you can create your own aliases for the traits. Instead of typing colon colon value, for example, you can create an alias called hasbullets underscore v. Let's get back to more cool things you can do with traits and Sphina. Let's learn how to create a trait that tells us whether a class has a member function or not. Here we use decalval, which allows us to create some kind of fake instance of a type for compile time evaluation purposes. If the run member function exists, then whatever its type that is, it becomes void and the specialization is selected. If player does not have a run member function, then Sphina and we use the base case. This is another very powerful technique that allows us to do introspection of a class and expose it via a very useful and readable trait. To summarize, we create a fake instance of player for evaluation and call its run member function. If that function exists, 
it has a type. We wrap that type into void so it matches the base case. If the run function does not exist, then Svine. Feel free to pause the video. Let's see how we would use this trait to choose one implementation over the other. There's the play function that takes a player and calls its run member function if it can run. We use the trait we previously created to do Svine on the return type. Note that in this code we use Svine in two occasions, one on the return type of the different play candidates and two at the can run trait specialization. In other words, Svine on top of Svine. Isn't that beautiful? So far we have demonstrated how to select different behavior with Svine using free functions. You can do this for functions that are members of a class too. There is only one catch. Here we see how we can choose a constructor depending on whether type T is integral or not. We exploit Svine in the unnamed defaulted argument of the constructor. The only difference is, is that we must redeclare the class types we want to use in the template parameter list of the function. You can see that on the line above the constructor declaration, template with type U being defaulted to T. When first encountering this, it was completely not obvious to me why this is necessary. And to be honest, it still isn't. I've read some explanations about this, but nothing that really convinced me on why it was necessary. Anyway, the idea is that you cannot use the class type T to do Svine in a class members directly because you're hijacking it. You need to create a new type U, default it to T and use that instead. Could it have been done better? I think so, but you know, that's how it is. What I want you to keep from this slide is that you can use Svine in class members too, if the substitution depends on a class template type parameter, you need to use it with a different name. Feel free to pause the video to take a better look at this oddity. So far we select behavior symmetrically. If the type satisfies a characteristic, do this, otherwise do that. We always provided an alternative. What happens if we don't? Well, that's totally fine and very useful in fact. We may want some features available only for certain traits. Take a look at this class for example. The only for integrals member function is only available for integral numbers. If we instantiate a conditional method class with a double, then trying to invoke only for integrals on that instance will fail to compile. Let's take a look at an earlier example where the player class gets capabilities from its add-ons. Assuming that we have created our own can fly and can sail traits, we use them to enable certain member functions. A player class, for instance, may have a fly member function only if the add-on provides flying capabilities. At the same time, a player class instance may have a sail member function only if the add-on provides sailing capabilities. A player with a jetpack can fly but cannot sail. A player with a boat can sail but cannot fly. This is a very powerful technique because we make API misuse obvious at compile time. We do not need to wait for our code to run to find out that we are doing something wrong. We shouldn't be flying with a boat, right? Remember, in this slide we did not introduce any new feature. It's more of a cool use case of Svine. What's most important is that it doesn't look too bad either, right? The last thing I want to quickly show you is how to use Svine with fold expressions. First. We create a trait that checks if a type has a serve beer member type definition. We assume that the type gives the permission to serve light alcohol. Then we check multiple types for the permission to serve light alcohol using a fold expression. Remember this junction? It is the logical OR of template metaprogramming. So if any of the permission allows us to serve light alcohol, then the result is true. That's it for this video. I have good news and bad news. 
The bad news is that there are some more ways to do Sphina, more ways to get weird compilation errors and get confused. The good thing is that you will not typically encounter them. I think the most complex thing you may see is a fold expression and Sphina without using traits to make you know, the code more readable. Hopefully, if you paid enough attention, you'll be able to put two and two together. If not, then don't worry, chances are you may not need to use Sphina at all. For example, if concepts are available, go for them instead. Overall, I hope you enjoyed this video and became more comfortable with Sphina. It's a very powerful technique. If done right, you use it only when you must and create your own traits. It's not too ugly either. Remember, if you want me to publish this tutorial in a written format, please subscribe to my channel. I will publish it once we reach 1000 subscribers and we're pretty close right now. Until next time, have fun substituting template parameters.